Um, Mona, every single election, you've been around politics a great deal. Um, probably a lot of people in this, in this audience have been around politics a great deal. And one of the things you always hear is, this is the most important election of our lifetime. <laughs> now, they can't all be right. They can't be telling the truth. I, I worked for a, for a candidate, a Democratic U.S. Senate candidate as a speechwriter, um, a very long time ago. Um, almost 40 years ago. And um, the, the slogan we used was, no ordinary election, no ordinary candidate. It's every candidate says that. You know, what, what somebody's going to campaign, I'm an ordinary candidate, and this is a very ordinary election. This is just typical. No, every election is supposed to be important. This election, a lot of people believe, might actually be important. It might actually be different. The election coming up less than five weeks from tonight. Mona Charon, is this election substantially more important than other recent electoral decisions? With the demurral that only sometimes in hindsight can you see which elections were actually pivotal and distinguish them from the ones that people just claim are highly important. Um, I do think that we have witnessed over the last 18 months um, an experiment with um, un unrestrained liberalism with the uh, left wing of the Democratic Party being able to enact its wish list. Uh, there had been a pent up demand, if you will, for uh, more spending, more government programs, uh, uh, nationalized health insurance and so on and so forth that had been building for a very long time. The Democrats achieved their majorities and they have enacted. And, and to um, echo your point, Michael, which I was trying to say, but I didn't say it as well as you did, but the debt is the great issue. The American people are responding uh, to what they perceive to be a threat to their very uh, futures to their to their children's uh, expectation. Now, record numbers of Americans are saying that they do not expect their children to have as good a life as they had, and they are deeply worried. Though President Obama constantly stresses that nobody will have to pay the bill for all of this except for the very rich, which is absolutely preposterous. Because even if you confiscated all of the income of everybody in the top 1% or the top 2% of earners, you still would never be able to pay the bills that are being wrapped up, not just by the federal government, but by state governments as well, which I don't have to tell anybody in California. Um, it is, um, so we are faced with an emergency about whether we can get this kind of gov runaway government, runaway promises, um, and runaway debt under control. That, I think, much more than issues about homosexual marriage or, or abortion or, you know, many of it, and not to say that those issues aren't important, but this time around, I do believe that the successful candidate will be the one who says, we must be responsible, we must live within our means, we must get the debt under control and get uh, regain our uh, uh, our financial stability as a country. Uh, in what the press likes to call the settlements, I, I prefer to refer to them as communities. Uh, that some of them that some of them that have flourished um, for. More than 30 years, some some for more than 40 years. Uh, the um, the United States is deeply, deeply committed to keeping these current peace talks alive, even uh, under the dire, horrific threat of some Jewish families uh, adding additional bedrooms to accommodate their children. Um, what's what's the right answer? to an administration that believes that building is a greater threat to peace than bombing.
articulate. <laughs> but, it, but it is very important to begin to understand and try to explain to people the principle that they're, that, is, that they're trying to establish, which is not that concessions come through negotiations, but that the Israelis must make concessions in order to have negotiations. That, in other words, it would be one thing to say we're going to sit down and see if we can get a, a, a further end to any possible building in the West Bank, and we'll negotiate that. But they're not. They're saying we will not stay there, especially since the Israelis know, and in fact anybody with an IQ over about 25 should know, that these negotiations cannot go anywhere at all. They can't. And this is a very important part of this as well, because you have Time magazine saying, well, the reason the negotiations can't go anywhere, this isn't a cover story, is because the Israelis are so busy and happy making money that they have no interest in peace. Yeah. Now, this was uh, uh, Andrew Roberts, a great Brit a British historian, said this is the most anti-Semitic article he has read in a major American publication since the 1930s. It is a total slander of the, of the Israelis who know what Time Magazine evidently does not, which is that Hamas, which controls Gaza, one of the two main Palestinian territories, is not just politically but theologically opposed to the existence of Israel. It cannot accept an infidel state on land ever conquered by Muslims. And Mahmoud Abbas, were he to take the step and settle with the Israelis, as Sadat did in 1979, would end up as Sadat did in 1981, dying in a pool of his own blood. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not to take issue with Andrew Roberts, who's a august historian, but I think Time Magazine itself, uh, back in the 1970s, when they introduced Menachem Begin after he was elected uh, Prime Minister of Israel, and they introduced him by saying, Menachem Begin rhymes with Fagan, uh, if you'll recall that, which for those of you who've read your Oliver Twist, you understand the anti-Semitic reference. Wait, wait, I have another one. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Back in the first Gulf War, um, ABC, when, as you recall, um, Saddam attacked Israel with missiles, and the United States, under the first President Bush, asked Israel not to respond, to absorb these attacks without responding, something Israel had never before done in its history, but Israel did agree to do that. A, an ABC News reporter uh, filed a report from Jerusalem, uh, sorry, from Tel Aviv, describing these missiles uh, coming in, and there were Jews, he said, Israelis had gone to a concert, um, and uh, the missiles were falling, and the Israelis all stayed at the concert because they wanted to get their money's worth. Oh. Um, David, uh, to, to get our money's worth out of you, um, <laughs> the, um, President Obama has promised that uh, these peace talks will be successful within a year. Uh, do you expect that this will go as well as his promise to close Guantanamo uh, within a year? <laughs> Just say yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, well, I, I cease to be su uh, surprised by this administration. Um, uh, Bill Clinton's greatest mistake uh, as a master politician that he was, was uh, Health care, Hillary, Hillary care, and yet Obama um, spent the first year, year and a half of his administration pushing, ramming through a uh, health care program that nobody wanted, and he's paying the price now. The Clinton's second big mistake was peace talks uh, uh, with Arafat. Uh, no peace talks can succeed because the Palestinians. And when I say the Palestinians, I don't mean Abbas, I don't mean Hamas, I mean the Palestinian people as a whole want to destroy the state of Israel and push the Jews into the sea. That's been their goal since the 1920s, uh, and it has never wavered, and there is no peace agreement that they will accept, uh, which, uh, which validates the Jewish state. And uh, so there is no success here. And I, I want to disagree with the panel about bankruptcy. Um, bankruptcy is a, a symptom of the problem. The problem is, is political. Um, I just was writing about this, so I know that the national debt 
as a percentage of gross national product. It's higher now than it's ever been since the Second World War, but it was a lot higher during the Second World War. And after the war, we rebuilt the nation, rebuilt the economy, and came out of it. Uh, it's a matter of will. And the same thing though, it applies uh, to the Middle East. Uh, the only way there's going to be peace in the Middle East is if the West, well, the West isn't going to do this, if Israel and the United States will stand down the Palestinians. If they have to be crushed militarily to do it, then crush them. And teach them that bombing, that suicide bombing and, and all their other tactics will get them nothing, absolutely nothing. And the same has to be applied to Islam. Uh, Somebody wrote a book, I can't remember his name, called The Strong Horse and the Weak Horse. Lee Smith. Lee Smith. This is the whole issue. People respect power. That's what they respect. And if you're on the left, you don't want to face that. The left is always in denial. It's a religious movement. It is not based in reality. People who live in the real world understand that whatever the, the hopey, changey, Peace. Let's all get together. All of that is so much baloney. What people understand is power. And unless the Palestinians and the Islamists and Al Qaeda and the Arab world generally understands that they're going to be faced with an iron fist unless they're willing to live in that. for us not to lose sight of the fact that it is that the leadership in the West at the moment um, is rewarding the wrong things. That is, there are voices within the Middle East, uh, there are voices even within Islam who want liberty, who want freedom, who want to live in peace. Um, unfortunately, we have been appeasing and dealing with the worst elements. And I will give you as an example, um, just a few months after President Obama came into office, he was presented with the most golden of opportunities that perhaps any president has ever been handed. A huge uprising within Iran, an Islamic country, the people in the streets begging for liberty, um, we now know that Khamenei had a plane gassed up on the runway at the airport in Tehran. That's how worried he was that he might have to make a quick escape. And in that moment, when the U.S. should have given every support to the Green Movement, to the, to the people in the streets, to those who love liberty and who were hoping to overthrow this vicious regime, the President, unfortunately, supported the thugs. Did, 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 you, did, you, did you know that there were two things they were, they were shouting during those demonstrations? One was deaths to the victims.